Kia ora, bonjour à tous. Uh, hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I come from France, Europe, uh, then 14 years in North America, Canada, and now uh, I moved in permanently to Wellington just a couple of months ago. Um, so I'm coming from mostly a uh, software engineering background, but I'm very interested in um, the topics of digital activism, open source and open data. So in general, how we can use technology to improve things, but not necessarily like in the you know, California and capitalist mindset, but more social community uh, mindset. Um, and I think personally, since I was a kid, uh, I've always been fascinated with the idea of using the city as a playground for public expression. Uh, you know, like the Greeks used to do graffitis uh, already, and I find it's, it's a place for everyone, and we should try to use it as such. Um, and this talk is going to be focused on the kind of weird topic of locative media. So how many people have heard about locative media here or locative art? And maybe one, two, oh, yeah, more than I expected. Um, so the, I think like one of the examples that probably everyone knows is uh, Pokemon Go. So it's a game uh, that people play on the phone that uses um, the city grid, so the physical map of the city, as the playground. And people go to specific places that are marked on the map on their mobile phone to hunt Pokemons. And what happened when the game was first released, you'd have like mobs of people forming organically at street, street corners because people were chasing Pikachu, for instance. And, and Pokemon Go is what we called an a ARG, so alternate reality game or augmented reality game, where uh, the game is overlaid on top uh, of, of what you see. Uh, but Pokemon Go is not the first uh, iteration. The first iteration by the same company uh, called Niantic was Ingress, um, which originally was working with Google Maps as a, as a substrate to play the game. And the purpose of the game was that players had to go physically into places and claim territory um, in some kind of um, game where corporations and, uh, and people were fighting uh, for world domination kind of conspiracy uh, aspect to it. Uh, but besides like these more well-known uh, applications, uh, there is a very interesting cross-disciplinary digital studio uh, in UK called Blastery, so some of you might have known of it. Um, and specifically that piece back uh, in 2011, so a while ago, uh, called A Machine to See With. And uh, the description goes like this. Just listen to the voice on the phone, the voice tells you what to do. The voice says you're playing the lead in a movie, hide in the toilets, find a getaway car, stake out the bank and take a deep breath. You're going in. So it's an immersive experience um, that happens in the city uh, and you start by calling a phone number and uh, the voice on the phone number tells you what to do, to go to a place and then calls you back. So it's, it's very interesting because um, the space in which the uh, um, experience takes place is the space we know, like the city, uh, but the substrate, the medium on which uh, it operates is animated through um, a voice uh, automated system and your phone. So in, in, like, in a way to experience the, um, uh, the project, you need to have the synergy between the technology and uh, the location. But actually, the very first time I heard about locative art uh, was when I was uh, on my plane, on the plane to Denmark to do the first iteration of the project. And I had this book by William Gibson uh, in my luggage called Spook Country. I, I hadn't heard about it before, and I know Gibson, of course, because he's like big uh, in, in technology. And in that book, there was a very uh, complete description of locative art. Uh, specifically, one of the characters had created uh, AR, VR renditions of like fictional and past events that you could only experience by going to the place and hooking up um, specific hardware. And I don't remember like when that was published, but it was even before. And so, so that was like an inspiration for, for the project. Um, it's always good to turn to Wikipedia for like normative definitions. So uh, locative media, according to Wikipedia, concentrates on social interaction with a place and with technology. So that notion of place, technology, and community is very important. But for me, uh, I think the notion of having a, a digital overlay that is anchored in a physical space is more visual and, 
I think it's, it, it uh, characterizes my approach to lucrative media. And I really see it as uh, a new digital medium that uses the place as an integral part of the experience. So instead of creating a digital experience that is, you know, lives on the internet, is accessible from everywhere, here you take the place as the starting point or one of the core elements of how you create and design that experience. So one of the questions uh, that I was asking myself around that notion of uh, locative media is what happens when you tie information to the physical space as opposed to the internet? Um, and you create a de facto uh, information island that is disconnected from the network that creates a, networks, a network of its own. And that's, uh, some of these questions led to the first iteration uh, of that project, uh, so the platform, the technological uh, platform uh, called Invisible Islands. So the first iteration was made in Denmark in the city of Aarhus, which is like the second biggest city um, there, and that was back in 2014, so quite a while ago. Um, and the core idea was to create local information islands uh, disconnected from the internet, um, where users could share and access uh, content through their mobile phone. So now, something that was also very important to me was the notion of privacy. Uh, at the time, there was like the, you know, the WikiLeaks, Edward Snowden, and uh, we could see that there was government mass surveillance. And what I found interesting in that notion of offline networks, so disconnected uh, information islands, is that if you want to do surveillance, you, have to, you actually have to go there. You have to physically go to that place and connect to the network and you know, try to harvest the data. So I saw that as an opportunity to create like sharing and exchange safe havens. Um, and that was also like one of the, the big motivation uh, in doing the project. Um, so to power these islands, I wanted to install like a dozen of them. Uh, so you cannot really, it's outdoors, so you need to have like cheap devices uh, that are low powered so that you can use batteries. Um, and you want to deploy them guerrilla style uh, in different locations in the city so you don't necessarily have access to, uh, to plugs either. Uh, and also because it's disconnected from the internet, you don't have Google, you don't have uh, URLs or domain names. Uh, so the, the way to access the content, um, I thought to use QR codes uh, printed on stickers and so you would scan the QR code using your mobile phone. It would take you uh, to a specific address uh, within the offline network, and you would access content like that. So, so basically, there's no search engine. The only way to access content is look around and try to find these QR codes. So it's a very interesting way to embed uh, layers of information hidden into like, the space that you, you see around you. Uh, so of course, like, you need to give concrete examples so that people can have a better idea of what it is. So imagine graffitis. You know graffitis, they're eminently ephemeral. Uh, they're washed out, painted over, removed. What if you can take a photo of a graffiti and um, you know, sterilize it into a QR code? And then you take your phone, scan the QR code, and you see it as it was before. So that notion of creating uh, layers of digital archive that are saved in situ, so exactly where you are. I thought also, uh, you know, Banksy is uh, exhibited uh, in galleries and sells for millions, but um, I find it would be great to have uh, the same contextual information uh, that you have when you go to an exhibition. Uh, so what if you have a QR code next to uh, a piece of street art that tells you more about the author and maybe the intent or the story of the piece? Uh, but more importantly, uh, I found there were many opportunities to uh, create links between places in the city um, by using QR codes as a wayfinding element that will take you from uh, you know, something that would be on the mainstreams where tourists go like a museum and maybe give you uh, cues to go off the beaten path and discover places uh, that's more community focused uh, where you know, non-tourists and people living here interact with each other. Uh, like here on that picture, uh, on the left, that's like center, old city of ours, um, with the like, you know, museums and, uh, and touristy area. On the right, that's Gottsbannen, which is a little bit uh, off-centered, and it's a very lively uh, community of makers, uh, creators, and, and very like local. 
So how, how do you create uh, links between these places and uh, encourage people to cross-pollinate? So to do that, uh, of course, like you need to create hardware. So I played a little bit with a 3D printer with a lot of success, uh, as you can see here. Uh, <laughs> after a few iterations, I managed to do something that didn't look very good, but at least it was functional. Uh, so the devices, they need to have um, a relatively good range, Wi-Fi range, so you have that big dongle here. Um, they need to be tropicalized, so that means they be, need to be um, resistant to some extent of, to moisture and, um, and rain. Uh, the only problem I found is that uh, solar panels didn't really work well and the batteries did not have enough capacity to, to last more than four or five hours. So I really need to, to plug the, the device for, for them to work. So that was like a limitation uh, in that iteration of the project. And, uh, and then we proceeded to deploy uh, the, the islands in different places, like in God, God's Bannon here, and try to see how people would use it. Um, and to do that, we created a workshop. Uh, you can see uh, printed QR codes. Here you have QR codes with pictures embedded. So we try to play with the, the medium of QR codes as something that would be more than just like, you know, this noisy uh, pattern. And so people started to think about uh, potential applications. And you see uh, Rasmus in the middle with a pen and, a, and a, the shirt. And Rasmus is a scout. So during the weekends, he animates uh, scout camps. And he had this idea of creating uh, a game not unlike Ingress, where uh, you know, it's a story of corporations and citizens, like the same theme, but uh, that would take place in a forest, and the QR codes would be hidden in trees. And he was actually carrying the islands on his backpack. So he took the same idea of like, a game, wayfinding, using um, the, um, the location uh, in an unusual way, and created a new whole application for it. And I found that super interesting uh, and showed that definitely like, there was something there uh, and it could be used uh, as, a, as a medium for, for creating experiences. Uh, that takes me to the, the second iteration of the project uh, called Les Îles Invisibles, which is like the French translation of Invisible Islands, uh, this time in Montreal uh, a year after in 2015. So that iteration of the project uh, was made uh, in collaboration with the National Film Board and the Quartier des Spectacles, which, which is where you have like all the museums, all the venues, uh, Le Festival de Jazz also, which is very well known. Um, and Daniel is like the best person for the project, really. Um, he, he's passionate about walking and exploring cities. He talks a lot about time and space and how we experience it. Uh, he has a very uh, poetic, uh, touching perspective on, on things. And, uh, and also he's like one of the pioneers of um, you know, cross-media, digital. Uh, he actually did CD-ROMs you know, in, uh, in the mid-90s. Um, and so it was a great opportunity and a, a very good fit for the project. Um, so at the time, I was starting to think that QR codes were probably not the best. They felt a little bit awkward to interact with. And I was looking for uh, alternatives in terms of how do you advertise the content? How do you make the content discoverable? And uh, if you've been to Montreal, you know that it's always in construction. Like the symbol of, uh, of Montreal should be a, a working cone, you know? Uh, and uh, so if you look on the floor, you'll see on the ground, you'll see like the, the markings that uh, construction workers do to indicate uh, gas pipes and, uh, and work. So there is already like that kind of natural uh, overlaying on of information that you find uh, in the city. I also found that uh, like the more official institutions were using uh, you know, stickers on the floor um, to do wayfinding and orient people uh, on the streets. And there's also like the more you know, random things like a construction person like leaving some duct tape and a number. I don't really know what it's for, but uh, it's still part of the you know, these layers of information that you find uh, naturally in the city. So our thinking was like, can we, can we try to use some of these uh, communication mechanisms to embed our own layer of communication that would be invisible if you don't know what you're looking for? So we really try to have something that's almost camouflage, a layer of information that is there but not really. 
And so what we thought about doing is to spray paint um, markings uh, on the floor and create sites of interest, so denoted by these kind of wavy lines and a cryptic symbol. And instead of using QR codes, uh, we would be using numbers, um, like dates, that would relate to events uh, in the past, in the present, and in the future as well. And you would have uh, that website, uh, so a progressive web, web application that works offline as well, um, where you can enter the number. And um, for each uh, number that you enter, you unlock a fragment of content. So the way it worked in practice is you imagine the Cartier de Spectacle, which is uh, you know, uh, it's quite big, uh, and you're out of the metro station, which is the Saint Laurent station, which is central. You come out and you see that uh, panel that tells you to take your mobile phone, uh, connect to the Wi-Fi network Les Îles Invisibles, open your browser, so normally you're redirected to that, um, and, and then you, you follow the instructions. What you would see on your phone is a map with the, where you are, like the, the triangle, the Saint Laurent station, and uh, an overlay. And so what you see here is uh, the the context, the spatial context in which the story takes place. And it's, uh, the story is about uh, Le Quartier des Spectacles now and how it was before and how it's going to be in the future after the rising of the sea levels and, um, and then the creation of islands, uh, physical islands uh, in that location. So some of the sites will be submerged, some of those will be um, emerged. And, and so if you, if you start to look around uh, from that panel, you'll see these small markings, these arrows. And if you follow them, uh, then you end up uh, in sight. So we actually uh, created that kind of alphabet of symbols that you see here. And the waves would, of course, um, uh, like remind you of the, the rising sea levels, which is like one of the, the trope of the, of the story. And, uh, and looking around the sites, you'll find the numbers uh, that you use to, to decode the fragments of the story. Uh, so I think we had maybe 16 sites and 72 fragments, so quite a lot of content. But you wouldn't necessarily need to read them in order or read them all. Uh, and uh, what we wanted to do also, coming back to one of the slides I had before, we wanted to connect uh, places and take you to places that you wouldn't necessarily know. So maybe like you've been, the Quartier de Spectacle is very popular. I mean, like everyone living in Montreal spends time there, but there are some parts of it where people don't necessarily go. And so part of the, the design of the experience was to try to take people outside of the beaten path as well as on the, the regular path as well. And, and so as you visit the sites, uh, then you unlock content and each, each time you uh, get a, le um, a letter of an alphabet, uh, so I forgot to mention that at the beginning of, of the experience, you have that letter uh, that you cannot read. The only thing you can read is the first sentence, which is uh, cher, cher, which means dear, dear uh, in English. So it's kind of you know, cryptic, uh, but you want to know more. And, and so as you, you read, you collect the fragments of the story, you understand more about the context, and also um, you're, you have more characters to decipher that letter. At some, points, uh, at some point, you'll be able to read it. So that acted also um, as a game element to encourage exploring and like, reading more about the, the story and going to, to more sites. Uh, so what I found super interesting is that it was not that difficult to have uh, permits to spray paint uh, on the ground. And by the way, that's a special type of paint that goes away after a month, so that was fine. But the one thing that I was not allowed to do in the project was to open up the islands for public expression. Uh, so that means the content was read-only and people were not able to create their own codes. I, ho I had hoped that people would uh, add codes to the site and expand the story. Um, but actually, people at the, at the city were worried about uh, the lack of moderation. And so they just said, uh, if we cannot moderate, then uh, we don't want people to be able to um, share content. So I found that very interesting, um, how like, the expression public space can be restricted for reasons like that. 
Um, so the project was super interesting, and I think for me, definitely showed me that uh, uh, locative media has a lot of potential, and there are still many, many opportunities um, to explore. Uh, although that was like five years ago, there's still a lot going on. Uh, something that has definitely changed is uh, the rise in mobile technologies. They're catching up. You have AR, uh, augmented reality, machine learning, artificial intelligence for shape recognition. Uh, NFC, which is uh, near field communication. So if I go close to a place, uh, the contents can update. And also I had friends working on Wi-Fi triangulation, so you can have like sub-meter precision uh, using Wi-Fi, which is what was not really possible just a few years ago. And uh, thinking about Wellington specifically, uh, when space is scarce, when you have a lack of uh, like exhibition spaces, then locative media uh, offers you the option of using um, the street, basically any space, uh, as an exhibition space. So it has some very interesting property at a relatively low cost. Um, and something that I also find interesting is uh, the ability to uh, experience art 24-7. Uh, as a teenager, I loved uh, hanging out in the city after midnight, uh, but of course everything is closed, uh, so you don't necessarily have a lot to do. What if uh, you have like in front of museums and galleries uh, offline networks where you can connect and access some content? Uh, I think that idea is, uh, is quite interesting. Uh, so yeah, discussions are still definitely going on uh, in the field. Uh, there's progress being made. Uh, there's an article published uh, very recently uh, in November in Forbes uh, interviewing different people working in AR and VR. Uh, and, uh, and some of the quotes uh, resonated with me. Uh, one of them is, at the current early stage of this new art form, so that's AR, VR, locations are absolutely critical to create the new audiences we need. So I find it interesting that, you know, like creating new audiences using location and that kind of technology. Another quote is, uh, it's a good thing that not everything can be consumed at home by yourself, but that you also uh, force an intrigue to go and experience things in other places. And I think that's also interesting to take that in the context of the epidemic of loneliness. Uh, I don't know if it's the case in New Zealand, but in the States and in Canada, it's certainly like a major health issue. And uh, it's an interesting opportunity to use technology as a way uh, and mobile phones as a way to take people out of the screen and back uh, in, in the physical space and encourage like face-to-face -face meetings and interactions. Uh, so there's a lot of potential there. And uh, definitely, uh, you know, Apple saw that potential. So they're, um, they're actually, um, they created that application called ART uh, Walkthrough here in Manhattan where they um, commissioned uh, artists, like mostly like big artists, uh, to create AR pieces. So they don't have to ask the permission of the city, you just need your iPhone and the application, and then uh, just it acts as a window into that overlay. And so you have many pieces in installed virtually throughout the city. It's a very interesting experience because it's large scale, like really good artists, really good content, and also it showcases like the, the advances in technology. Uh, something that's uh, very dear to me is uh, like interactive audio walks. So of course, like you have AR where it's very, very visual, but when you walk, you don't necessarily want to be like looking at your phone all the time. You want to be looking around. Uh, so, if, so if you have a, a headset, you can listen. And uh, I feel like the problem with audio guides is very often it's not uh, interactive enough. But if you leverage near field communication, Wi-Fi triangulation, you can really make something more interactive. And then you have tools uh, to create these links, uh, both from the inside of the building to the outside, and also um, across buildings in the city, and create like a, a mesh of uh, virtual links. Uh, there's also a recent article that I found quite interesting uh, by Dr. Stephen Conway from the Smart Cities Research Institute in Swinburne, Australia, published in November as well, um, called from monologue to dialogue towards playable cities. And, um, and I think his point is that um, games and applications like uh, Pokemon Go, they don't really care about the city. They're not designed uh, for the city. If you remember, like, one of the definitions of uh, locative content 
and locative media is that it needs to be designed for the location, needs to be location specific. But Pokemon Go is not location specific. It just uses the, the grid of the city as you know, a playground, but doesn't really care what it is. And that creates a monologue where just a one-way communication. But if you create a dialogue, um, it means that the AR, VR content is designed for the place specifically. And as uh, Dr. Stephen Conway said, we can open up spaces previously close to us and hopefully encourage new ways of perceiving, feeling, and expressing ourselves. And that really resonates to me with uh, the core goals of uh, locative media. Uh, so again, like locative media <laughs> has a lot, lot of potential. Uh, it's still a field that's pretty um, active. And uh, if you want to talk about it, that's my email and uh, my Twitter handle. I'm going to be more active now. Thank you very much.